I already looked at a few immutable distributions a while back and while I like most of the concepts I also decided they aren't for me. But this week we saw the release of Vanilla OS 2. And since you wanted me to take a look at that thing, or at least you told me that you had no idea what Vanilla OS was, well, I decided to give a look at Vanilla OS 2, what it is, and why, in my opinion, it's the immutable distro concept polished to a state where almost anyone could use it. And since we don't have a sponsor here, I'm just going to remind you that if you support me on Patreon or YouTube membership starting with $1 a month, you can get a daily Linux and open source news show in audio format from Monday to Friday. You get the right to vote on the topics I cover, you get a weekly patron cast and a few other things. So check the links in the description if that's something that could interest you. So just to get started, let's recap what Vanilla OS is. It's what we call an immutable system, meaning the base is mostly read-only by default and it's updated after a reboot, just like SteamOS on the Steam Deck or Fedora Silverblue. It works on a dual partition system. You have two main slash partitions at the same time. The one you're currently running on and the one that will receive the updates. When you reboot, you move to the most up-to-date one, and if something is broken, you can always go back to the older partition instead. And before you close this video in horror at the idea of not being able to change the slash partition or its contents, or having to learn a new tool, let me reassure you, it's all pretty easy in here. You can still install packages onto the base system from the Debian repos because Vanilla OS is based on a snapshot of Debian SID. You can use any system tool that lets you change configurations. You can still edit some config files with a specific tool as well. And as a matter of fact, Vanilla OS even includes a sort of declarative file a la NixOS to let you replicate your config on other systems. It also lets you install packages and apps from any other Linux distribution through containers or through a single package manager with a graphical user interface or the command line with a single syntax. And Vanilla OS 2, codenamed Orchid, also includes support for Android apps and some automation features. And basically for every limitation of the immutable distro format, they have a tool that lets you handle that nicely and graphically. So now let's dive into all the new features and see if it's all roses and rainbows or I guess orchids and, and rainbows. So Vanilla OS was already using this principle of distro containers. They let you create an Arch, an OpenSUSE, a Fedora or whatever else container on the fly. You could install packages in any of these through a single package manager called Apex or APX. Of course, it also supported flat packs because that's generally how you install your software on a read-only system. But this time around, they added Android support, meaning you can actually install your favorite gacha game and waste the entire afternoon farming for some kind of fairy dust that you need to upgrade your scantily clad character. I'm, I'm not judging, I know you're playing this for the plot. Now, the way it works is, of course, through WayDroid, but they've integrated that pretty well. You can simply download an APK and double-click it to bring a graphical installer that will add this app to your application's menu. It works in the same way for standalone deb packages that you would like to install and aren't in the Debian package repos. Because yes, while Vanilla OS 1 was based on Ubuntu, Vanilla OS 2 is based on Debian SID, at least a snapshot that they turn into a system image once testing confirms it works well. The WayDroid subsystem is isolated from the main system, but it can still access your user directory. So of course, only install Android apps that you trust from sources that you trust. In my experience, things ran decently well, unless you use the Nvidia drivers, in which case you're stuck on X11, not Wayland, meaning WayDroid won't work. Now, also, yes, I tested everything here on a real laptop because testing a distro in a VM is the coward's way. And sometimes I still do it because I'm French and cowardice is a tradition for us unless you threaten our food or our wine. Now, speaking of NVIDIA, you can also launch a prime utility from the display settings of GNOME, meaning you have a graphical way of switching between the integrated, dedicated or hybrid graphics mode. 
Apart from that, you still have access to all the distro containers that Vanilla OS already had. You can create one graphically or using the Apex Package Manager tool, and you can see the list of programs that have been installed in each container. Now, the new version of Apex is also more flexible. It lets you add distribution containers, but it also lets you add distros through just the package manager you want to add. If you want to add support for Pac-Man, you can just add that and Apex will create the right distro container for you so you can run Apex in the terminal and install stuff through the Arch repos. Apex also lets you create stacks. A stack is a combination of a distribution base, of a package manager and optionally a set of packages you want pre-installed. These stacks are then used to deploy a subsystem, which is basically just a container. For example, you create a stack with Fedora, with uh, the DNF package manager, and I don't know, three or four different dev libraries that you pre-install. With that stack, you can then deploy three different Fedora dev containers to try out a few different things. You can delete all these containers and keep your stack alive so you can deploy more of these containers after that. Now this lets you install software from any distribution, graphical or not, and run it as if it was installed natively on your base system. You can create dev environments that are easy to replicate, to get rid of or to play around in. This is not a new solution by any means. A lot of other immutable distros or even non-immutable distros already let you do that. But in vanilla OS, you've got a nice graphical utility to manage all of that and a single package manager on top that lets you install software to the right container when you want it and then run that software straight from your base vanilla OS system without having to log into each specific container. The tooling around this is really, really nice and easy to use. Now, vanilla OS 2 also comes with a new smart updates system. This is a fancy name to say we will not download and install updates while you are working. In vanilla OS, this has a different meaning than in other non-immutable distros, because updates aren't installed in place to your current system. They're installed to your second root partition. You have an A partition, the current system, and a B partition that will receive the update. All your user stuff is in its own partition that is used by either A or B, depending on which root partition you're currently using. So before I explain further how things work, let me make sure that Gen Z or Gen Alpha brains can actually follow what I'm saying. There you go. So you've got an A partition and a B partition. When you install Vanilla OS, both partitions are in the exact same state. You start using vanilla OS on the A partition and then you download an update that is applied on the B partition. Then when you reboot, you reboot on the B partition and the A partition is still here so you can reboot if the B partition is broken. And then if you get updates during the B partition use, then the A partition will be updated and you'll always have your B partition to fall back onto if something is broken. And the smart update system that vanilla OS brings just means that the other partition that you're not currently using is not getting updates while you are working or using the computer, because that would divert resources from what you're currently doing. You'll even get a little indicator in the top panel to tell you that an update is ongoing, and you'll be able to stop that update if you don't want it. You can also set the frequency of these updates or disable them entirely. I know some of you don't like anything to be automated on your computers, so there you can just disable everything. And those system updates are basically just snapshots of Debian SID that have been compiled into an OCI image that is tested by the vanilla OS devs. Once it is ready, they ship it to all vanilla OS systems, your currently unused partition is replaced by this image, and all the customizations you have applied are of course applied to this new image as well. And of course, flat packs and packages from distro containers are updated normally like on any other distro. The other major change for vanilla OS is the ability to get some NixOS-like features with a descriptive file that lets you detail what you want to add or run when you start your system and port that to create other system images that can be deployed on other computers. This is handled through a new tool called Vanilla Image Builder or Vib or Vibe. This lets you create a vanilla OS image with a bunch of customizations already added to it through a simple descriptive file. 
You can add specific packages, specific drivers, codecs. You can add commands that need to be run at install or at startup. You can change some configurations and more. Now, this project is actually much larger than just vanilla OS images. It basically lets you create any kind of Docker image with a specific other distro base and a specific application pre-installed in it. But it is useful to replicate your vanilla OS system as well. Now, in terms of automation, Vanilla OS comes with VSO for Vanilla System Operator. This lets you create tasks that have conditions and instructions. If the conditions are met, the instructions are ran. These conditions include disconnecting from the network, reconnecting to it, when you're on low battery, when a specific process starts or ends, when a new device is connected or disconnected, when your CPU usage is high, and other things. And you can also just specify a script or a specific command as the condition. And VSO itself is actually much more than just an automation system. It also lets you manage through the command line the WayDroid subsystem. It lets you export an application from a container to your app menu or app grid. It also lets you sideload APKs or dev packages and a lot more. It's the core of what makes Vanilla OS a bit better than any distro with just DistroBox slapped on it. So Vanilla OS 2 is still an immutable distro with some limitations but most of them are bypassed with elegant tooling here. If you need a few apps that aren't available on Flatpak, you can create a distro container and install all of these apps that are available somewhere else. If those apps work for you, you can export them to your app menu and it's transparent. You can run them like you installed them natively and the performance is extremely close. If you need to install a simple dev package, you can just sideload it just like an Android app that could fill a gap in your app roster. If you need to change system configurations, you can use VSO to do so. And with all these little bypasses that you've done, if you realize that your system is now a nightmare to replicate on another computer, you can use Vib, the Vanilla OS image builder, to recreate that configuration and deploy it automatically on any other computer you want. All of it is graphical with nice GNOME looking tools and it's a pretty reassuring proposition. Now, Vanilla OS 1 was definitely not something I would have put in the hands of a beginner. And Vanilla OS 2, despite its efforts, still isn't. The very concept is, in my opinion, just too complicated to explain to anyone who is not familiar with Linux already. And I'll be honest, for my own needs, I don't need all of these containers, all of these immutable benefits like security, reliability, stability. This is not really for me. But compared to Vanilla OS 1, the second version feels like they've had a lot of time to polish things up and make it a lot more accessible than it once was. If you compare it with something similar like Blend OS, it's using the same kind of building system with a base immutable distro with distro containers on top of it, but those are two different approaches. Vanilla OS is Debian based, Blend OS is Arch based. Vanilla OS is GNOME only, Blend OS offers most popular desktops. Vanilla OS has reproducibility features, Blend OS is entirely declarative, like NixOS, and is easier to reproduce completely. Basically, Vanilla OS is the GNOME of this type of immutable distro, and Blend OS is its KDE. One is polished, pre-configured, and simple, with some power under the hood, the other one lets you do anything you want, but doesn't hold your hand at all. And in terms of ease of use and setup, Vanilla OS is miles easier to use than Blend OS. But for the target audience, for this kind of immutable distro with distro containers, I'm pretty sure they're already advanced enough to use Blend OS without needing all the help of Vanilla OS. So it all comes down to, do you prefer a Debian base or an Arch base? And personally, I'll go with Debian every time, especially since I can get all the advantages of Arch in a container and not on my base system where I could encounter some problems. Just like you'll now encounter this segue to our sponsor. It's Tuxedo Computers. You know them by now. They make laptops, desktops, and small form factor computers that run with Linux out of the box. I left a link to all their shop in the description below. 
I only use their computers nowadays. My entire channel is run on one of their laptops. I edit videos on Linux with one of their laptops. I game on Linux on one of their desktops. They have an awesome choice of computers for every price point, every need, lots of customization options, including keyboard layouts, your own logo on the computer, and a lot of components. And you know that Linux is just going to run better on those things than just buying something that was made to run for Windows. So if you're interested, you need a new computer, you want to support a company that actually contributes to Linux, there's a link in the description of the video. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, all the YouTube pleasantries are underneath it. Really helps uh, with making sure the channel grows and those videos are seen. And if you really want to support the channel, I talked about it at the beginning of the video. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.